But for all that he's done for me, I could never outlove him. You could never outlove him. We can never outlove the Lord. Listen to the words of this song. He said, uh, he looked at me very sincerely. He said, Bill, 
believe God wants you to plant a church for the KMHA in Jackson, Kentucky. Just as soon as he said it, it was as if the Holy Spirit spoke it right to my heart. I said, I God to do right. <laughs> so me and Bob go way back, almost two and a half years. <laughs> so, but yeah, so we're, we're privileged. It's kind of the full circle thing to have a preacher about. We are privileged to have it here. Does anybody, does anybody like to take up an offer? Let's pray. We're going to say a good prayer. And then, Shane, you take this half for him. Just take that half. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity for these young people who are willing and wanting to serve. Take that offering. So we want to pray. And ask that you would bless this offering. And we're going to bless this gathering here tonight. And Lord, just help us to continue to grow the kingdom here through this church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. with you 
And uh, it thrills me that you are doing so well as a church. And to feel that I had maybe just a little bit to do with getting this going and so on. Just the burden of my heart. God has ways of just, you know, He speaks and works and, you know, it's His will and what He wanted. And I was just a vessel at the time, I guess, and did just a little bit. Brother Bill was the man that God wanted to get things going. And he's doing a splendid job. I, I myself am very proud of him, and I hope you are. And I hope you love him and listen to him because he's going to do his best and he's going to lead you right if you'll, if you'll just let him listen carefully, follow what he's trying to teach you. Well, let's look at the scripture tonight. And I'm looking over in Revelation, and I believe it's chapter 20. there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were open. Folks, God's keeping an account of every thought that we have, every action that we commit, everything that we fail to do. God is keeping a perfect record. And when we stand before God, we're not going to be able to deny anything. Because He's got it all. He's not going to miss anything. Unless we repent of our sins, every one of them are going to be that. But if we repent, He changes our name, blocks out every one of our sins in that other book, that black book, and writes our name over here in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's where we want it, folks. And I'm telling you, we want it as soon as we can get it. He goes on and says, And another book was opened, which is the book of life. That's the one we want our name in. And he says, And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death, and we can say hell, because it really is. We're cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now let me say something to you here. Here the Bible is telling us that actually hell itself is going to give up its dead. And there's going to be a great judgment at God's white throne. They'll be judged. And then it says they'll be cast out. And Jesus says in Luke, They'll be cast out into outer darkness where they'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of their teeth. The pain, the terribleness, the remembrance of it all. And he says this, this is the second death. We die, but we never die. We'll be dying throughout all eternity if we miss heaven. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me do just maybe I could say a little riddle here. What lines are 50,000 miles long? Long enough to reach around the world two times and grows a half a mile longer each day. You know what it is? It's the people in America alone who are lost without God. They'll reach around the world twice and it grows a half a mile 
each day. The lost people in America. What I want to share with you in this message, a few decades ago, a few decades ago because I know I was there and I could preach it. People would hear a message like I am preaching tonight. And I'm honest, folks, they'd get under such conviction. And many, many of them would make their way to an altar of prayer and cry out to God that God would have mercy on them, forgive them, and save their souls. Sad to say, we don't see much of that today. Even though we preach a message like this and tell people there's going to be a judgment day, somehow we don't seem to get it in this day and time that there's a, there's a terrible day coming. There's a sad day coming. It's a judgment day of Almighty God and people are going to be judged for their sins. There won't be any argument, friend, as much as they say there will be. There won't be. Because if we stand before God, listen, He's going to have the last say. He's God and He will. Let me tell you a sad story. It's a personal one. I have a brother that is older than I. I have a brother that's older than me. My brother was not a Christian. I loved him dearly. He loved me. We were very close as far as that. Though our lifestyles were completely opposite. I chose to serve Jesus Christ and he chose to live in sin. My brother could curse, and he did. Matter of fact, almost every other word out of his mouth was a curse word. It was. One day, a few years ago, I don't know what happened. I don't know why, other than just maybe God. God in His faithfulness. But my brother went to a preacher in our hometown. And he said to that preacher, he said, Preacher, I want to get baptized and I want to do it right now. I don't want to wait till church time. I want to get baptized. I want to get right with God right now. The preacher obliged him. Baptized him. My brother changed. He quit cursing. He started going to church attending faithfully. Matter of fact, he had a baptistry built and put in the little church and paid for it himself where he was attending. He came down with cancer. He'd been a chain smoker. Smoked one cigarette right after the other. One right after the other. And he got it. He got it. The cancer came and of course he was in bad shape. Somewhere in the midst of all of this, I don't know whether it was before that he got the cancer, whatever it was, and I want you to listen to me carefully, but he joined the Masons of the Sonic Lodge. Masons don't teach or promote Jesus Christ. And they tell you that, you know, by joining them, that they can get you into heaven. You'll be a candidate for heaven. Well, friends, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven. There isn't anything else that's going to get anybody there. It's only Christ. Jesus says, I am the way. That means there isn't any other. He's the only one. And so I remember... I remember when my brother was so bad, I went home to spend some time with him because I wanted to talk to him, especially about his soul. I wanted to be with him, but I wanted to talk to him about being right with God. And I remember one day as, as he was sitting there and, and so frail, and I said to Dale, I said, Dale, I said, uh, I, said I want to know who you're putting your trust in. Are you, are you trusting in the Masons to get you to heaven? Or are you trusting in Jesus Christ to get you to heaven? I said, Jesus Christ alone will get you there. Not anything else. I said, you've got to trust in Him. He looked at me and he said, Bob, he said, everything's all right. He said, you don't need to worry about me. I don't know what he meant when he said that. I wish that actually I'd have taken more time and really questioned him and so on. But I did I don't know all the occasion, all the things that was going on. It was not well and and so on. And I, I, I didn't want to bother him too much. But folks, I regret it today that I didn't quiz him a little farther to find out 
just who he was trusting in, whether it was truly in Jesus Christ to get him there or not. And I'm going to tell you this. If my brother was not right with God, my brother that I love, my brother is today spending his life in the torments of hell and will throughout all eternity. I'll never get to enjoy our times together. We spend a lot of time together. And you'll suffer through all eternity. My brother. My great concern today is the lack of concern that many of us have, maybe about our own souls, but about our own family, our children, our companions, our family all around us that is lost, neighbors that are lost, and friends, lost people lose. Lost people lose. And at the same time, the kingdom of God loses because Jesus Christ wants to save. And I believe one of the biggest problems of our day in the church is that we are not concerned about the lost like we ought to be. And the reason is because too many in the church, the world out here, doesn't have the confidence in us because they're not seeing people live as godly as they ought to live. They know and they want us to live right before the Lord. Where is the victory? The victory that God has promised to us that we can live such a godly life that people can see it in us. We have a world that's lost and on a road to a devil's hell. It's sad to say there are many right in the church who are drifting just as well. And friends, unless we truly check ourselves and keep our hearts right with God, we too will split hell wide open. If you stop and think about it for five minutes, just five minutes, think about being lost and going to hell. And folks, you'll never get out. You'll be there throughout all eternity. Can you imagine the suffering that a person goes through when they're burning? That's exactly what's going on in the place called hell. And if we go there, you, you and I need to stop and think, I might go there if I'm not really where I ought to be with God. We will. We will. It's not a matter of being judged. You're already judged. You're already condemned. And I'm going to tell you something. People say, God won't send anybody to hell. No, He won't. We choose to go there. Did you know that? We either choose Jesus Christ and to serve God, or we choose to die and go to hell. And no choice is a choice. No choice is a choice. Hell is real, and it's not to be taken lightly. In my pastorate in southern Indiana, I had a man that I was trying my best to get him to the Lord. His family, some of them came to our church. And so I started visiting with him. As a matter of fact, his wife even came to our church. And I started visiting with him. He came down with cancer. And I started visiting with him and wanted to reach him, get him saved, get him right to go to heaven. And I'd go and I'd visit with him and I'd talk to him and I'd pray with him and so on. I remember he went into the hospital. And I went to the hospital to visit with him, and I thought, Lord, please help me today to be able to lead him to you, to win him to you, Lord. And I went with a, a real burden on my heart to reach him. But when I got to the hospital and walked up to his room and, and went in the door, he looked at me and he said, Preacher, he said, I got saved this morning, just a few minutes ago. He said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, old Slewfoot, we call him. The devil is who he's referring to. He said, old Slewfoot stood down here at the bottom of my bed. And he said, he'd come for me. He'd come to get me. He was going to take me to hell. And he said, preacher, he said, I began to cry out. And he said, there was another preacher, and I knew this preacher, Billy Hostetler, out of the same little town where I was pastoring. And Billy was standing out in the hall and he heard him cry. And he went in. He knew him. He went in there and he led him to the Lord. 
And let me tell you, the reason I said all that is this. I want you to understand there's a real devil. And there's a real hell. And friends, the devil wants to get individuals. He wants to destroy individuals. I can tell you this. He got gloriously saved. He really did. His life changed. And I remember on the day that he died. I had his funeral. But I remember the day that he died. And his family would even tell this. That in his room, in his room, the moment that he took his last breath, there was a beautiful light that just went right out from him and out of that room. Now you may not believe that kind of a thing, but folks, it's true. No, it wasn't sunshine. The sunshine didn't come into that room. It was out by itself, dark and hid. And yet that light went out of that room. Listen, we can be saved and we can know it. But I'm telling you, the devil's out to get every one of us. And he will if we can. We've got to do everything that we possibly can to try to reach the lost that is out there, that is out here all around us. Folks, may God help us somehow to get such a burden on our heart, such a vision of the lost of young people, kids. I hope you understand. And if we don't have Jesus Christ in our heart, we'll be lost. The devil's out to get you, to destroy you. He really is. And everyone, he wants to do that. We need to listen to God. And we need to let Him have His way in all of us. Now you, you today, in this day of time in which we live, I know I've gone out, I've knocked on doors. We had, we had visitation programs and so on, and God had helped us even in those times to be able to win people to the Lord. It was amazing how the Lord helped us as we go. And I, I know some of you are still going, and I hope that you do, and hope you keep right on going and knocking or going out and doing whatever you can, wherever you can. But I, I know this too. I know that people don't hardly want you to come to their homes anymore. They don't want you to bother them. But friends, you say, well, how in the world are we going to win them? I don't know. Get out here and meet them at Walmart or go to the hospital and visit them or, or whatever you got to do. Your neighbors, build a relationship with them. Your family, build a relationship with them. And somewhere, somewhere, and it won't be long, somewhere there's going to come a crisis in their life. And they're going to listen to what you've got to say. They're going to hear you. I had a sister that emailed, not emailed me, but texted me last night. She uh, was down in South Carolina. She has a home down there, and then they've got one in West Virginia. A little grand boy there in West Virginia. Some little kid, I don't know, they were out playing, but I don't know what in the world happened, but he, he broke a bottle over this little fellow's head, and, and he left him unconscious. I had a life flying away. My sister, not a Christian, but close to me. And she texted me and said, Bob, said, we're, we're headed home. Said, said the little boy that had the life flight into the university hospital and so on. I got one more text from her. She said that it had penetrated his eye. They were doing surgery, had been in surgery maybe for four hours or so. They wasn't sure that they could save it. I don't know what else. Don't know where he woke up or not even as far as that. Haven't heard from her since. But she called me because she wanted me to pray. She wanted me to pray. Listen, folks, they're out there. And we've got to do what we can to build relationships. And I, I told her, I said, she said, Bob, I don't know how much more I can take. I said to her in a text, and I said back, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. And she sent a little word back to me and said, I know He is. I said, yes, you do. You raised just like I did. And I said, what you got to do is you got to give your heart to Him, and He'll change things if you let Him. We've got a society up here that's lost that needs God. And folks, if we live the life, if we live in front of them, and we need to have a victory, and God wants to give us a victory that people can see there's such a change in us, a difference in us. And they see that we're steady, we're godly, we have a peace, we have a joy, and that's what God wants to put in our hearts. And if we'll let it and live that kind of a life, they'll see it in us. And then when comes the time of the crisis, They'll want to talk to us about Jesus Christ. They want to hear us and hear our prayers. I remember in one of my pastorates, God was blessing. We were seeing a lot of people getting saved and so on. It was amazing what was taking place in the little town. And, 
And I tell you, we were just having some of the most wonderful services and, and all oh, the Lord was there and people were just getting saved and getting saved. And I remember this one old boy, I was, I was taking EMT training at the time with him. And he come up to me in one of our breaks and he said, Preacher, he said, are you praying for me? And I said, no, I haven't been praying for you. I said, I will from now on. And I started praying for him. And I started visiting with him. It wasn't long until I saw him get into the church and I saw him get saved and really give his heart to God. And as he, as he, his life changed and so on, and he was living so close to the Lord, we, was, we went out hunting, deer hunting one day. Several of us together. He was one of them and he had invited his cousin to go along with us. His cousin, the big old lumberjack. I remember out there we'd hunted during the morning. I don't know if any of us had gotten anything that morning, but anyway, we were coming back in to get us some lunch and so on. And the big old one for Jack looked over at us and he said, fellas, he said, when's somebody going to tell me how to get saved? He said, why in the world did he do that? Because he had seen something so different in that cousin of his that had gotten saved. And he said, I want what he's got. Big old lumberjack of a guy. And finally we saw him get in and get saved. And, and, and I know here, not long ago he died now, and he's gone to be with Jesus Christ. Folks, we, we need to live the life so that we can reach others. When's somebody going to tell me about Jesus? I remember it was a home we'd been visiting in for some time. We'd go and visit with them and so on. And I don't know whether we'd even got them coming to church yet or not, but I remember going to their home on this particular night and and I, I began to talk to them about spiritual things and, and they looked at me and said, when's somebody going to tell us how to get right with God? And that night I told them how to get right with God. Listen friends, you go, you do your best to build a relationship with people and live the life in front of them. Let them know that you're a Christian. Let them know that you're praying for them and you can help them get to God. They'll hear you. They really will as they watch and observe that there's something different about you. And one of the ways they'll really know there's something different is when you're going through the difficult time that you still got a smile on your face and you still got victory in your soul and you can still say, God is still good in the midst of it all. That's what it takes, friends. They need to see something like that because they know you ain't, you're not the one that's doing it. Somebody has to be greater that's inside of you that's doing it. We need God to get through to us. We need Him to get through to us. Let me let me tell you another story. It's true. It's really a true story. It's about a, a preacher buddy of mine down in Georgia, matter of fact. He said one day he was praying. He has a large church. He's, he's, I don't know, God has blessed him and helped him be able to encourage his people to invite people to come. And God's blessed and given them a number of souls and so on. And he said one day, he said, you know, he says, I... I just stayed after my people all the time trying to get them to visit and try to get them to, to, to reach people and invite them to church and win souls and so on. He said, one day I was praying. He said, Lord, he said, is there a, is there a way that I can just back off a little bit and not pressure them so hard, you know, about witnessing, about winning souls and so on? And he said, God spoke to him. And he said to him, he said, Heaven, he said, do you have three children? He said, yes. He said, would you write your names down on a piece of paper? Kevin said he wrote down all three of those kids' names on a piece of paper. All three of their names. God says, now I want you to take that pen and I want you to circle two up. And he said, those two, he says, I'm going to save. And he said, the other one is going to die and go to heaven. Kevin said, I broke down. He said, I went to weep before God. Now think about this. What if God said that to you? What if God said to you? You write down your family. Your, your, maybe it's not your kids. Maybe it's, maybe it's your brothers or sisters. Maybe it's your mom and dad. Maybe it's somebody. But then He says, I want you to run, draw a circle around these and I want you to leave this one out. And He said, you choose. Could you do it? Could you do it? I don't think so. He said, I couldn't choose. These will be saved, but that one will be lost. Folks, I'll tell you what told that story, it touched my heart very deep. And I can't get over it. I still can't get over it. I think of, of mine and my family that are unsafe. And I say, I can't draw a circle around. I don't want any of them to be lost. My old brother, I don't know where he made it or not. I 
can't change it now. It's too late. But folks, those that are living, we can, we can do something about it. We can pray. We can pray. And we can witness to them. We can live the life in front of them. And hopefully God will help us to be able to get in it. God hears and answers our prayers, folks. He does. And we need to pray. We need to plead His blood over these that are lost. We need to weep over them. We need to see them. No, not a one of them. Not a one of them do we want lost. Not a one. Are we willing for people to pass through our hands and be lost? Are we willing to do that? Or do we really want to see people get to the Lord? Let me tell you another story. I had another fellow. His family was in my church. His brother, his mother was in the church. He came down with cancer. And I started visiting with him. He didn't come to church. He'd never come to church. But I started visiting with him. And I would, as I would visit, I would ask him if they'd let me pray. And they'd let me pray. And I remember one day that I went to their home and I thought, God, he's getting, he's getting worse all the time. The doctor said there's nothing they can do. The cancer is it's just the kind that there's nothing they can do. And, and so he's just living out his time. And he's getting closer all the time, leaving this whole world. And so I remember, I remember as I, I visit back and forth, and then on this particular day, I thought I've got to try to talk to him about his soul. I want to get him to God. And so I began to talk to him. I said, Keith, I said, I know that you're you're sick. You know you're sick. You've got cancer. You're not going to make it too much longer. I said, Keith, I said, I want you to get right with God. I said, uh, I said, would you care if I, I I showed you what you need to do in the Scriptures, how to, how to get saved, how to get right with God? And he looked over at me and he bristled up and he said, Preacher, he said, I'm an agnostic. I'm not a believer. And he said, no, I don't want to get saved. His wife was standing there beside of him and boy, she bristled as well. And she said to me, and I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. And I thought, oh boy, this is, this is going to be something. Well, I asked them, I said, can I come back? They said, sure, you can come back. I'd go and I'd visit with them and I'd pray and I'd tell God on them. And I kept going back and forth and praying and visiting with them. I remember one Sunday, well, I'd finished up my church service and I just had such a burden on my heart. I felt like, I know he's getting close. I don't want to see him lost. I had this burden. God seemed like he was just telling me, you've got to go see him. And so even before I sat down to eat or anything, I left the church and I went straight to his home to visit. They had always told me, they said, now, you, you come down, you just come right on in, the door's always open. They moved him downstairs in a hospital bed in a big room, kind of a, just anyway, a big room down there, sitting room and so on, dim light. And so I opened the door and I walked in and he was laid over there in the hospital bed. I walked in where he was at and he said, Preacher, he said, I want to get saved. Well, I tell you what, that thrilled my heart. I knew God was leading me. I felt that and I, I felt, oh boy, this is wonderful, this is the time. And so I said to him, I said, Keith, I said, do you know what you need to do? You know what? How to get saved. Yes, I know that. I said, then let's pray. He said, no, not yet, Preacher. I said, no. He said, no. He said, I want to wait. He said, my little wife been up with me all night long. And he said, preacher, I want her to come down here. I want her to get saved with me. I want to wait until she's able to get up and get back down here. And I said, Keith, I said, you don't know that, that you can live long enough for her to even get up. I said, I said, I don't want you to miss it. He says, I don't want to miss it. But he says, I want to wait until she comes. And he told me this. He said, preacher, I want you to listen to me, friends. I'm talking about a place called hell. The Bible says they'll be cast out into outer darkness where they'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of their teeth and that forever and ever and ever and ever. Well, I tell you what, it's one thing to get burned and be able to get healing over it, but in hell you never get over it. And he told me that. He said, Preacher, he said last night I went to a place and he said it was black. He said, Preacher, I've never seen anything as black as the place where I was at. And he said, I screamed. And he said, I cried. He said, I wanted somebody to come and get me out of there. And he said, preacher, nobody came. God in His mercy 
I'm sure because of all the prayers that was prayed for him. God in His mercy allowed him to come back. And he said, Preacher, I don't want to go back there. Never again. I'm going to tell you something. If it wasn't hell fire, just the blackness itself would be torment almost enough in that place for all eternity. But my friends, it's going to be black and it's going to be hell fire for all eternity. I went home. I told him I'd be back after church that night and help him to get right with God. I tell you what, I, I couldn't be still at home. I was just carrying such a heavy burden I was afraid he was going to die before I could get back and get him to the Lord. I remember that. I remember that even before church. I, I just got in my car and I went back down to his house and when I got there and I walked in, his wife was standing down there by his side. We didn't do a lot of small talk. We got down right to business. He wanted to get saved. And I wanted to help him get saved. And so we, we got down to business and he prayed clear through. I tell you, his whole countenance changed. It was unbelievable just to see the change in his countenance. He had tears running down his cheeks. Hey, and I asked him, I said, Keith, I said, I said, is it all right between you and God now? And he said, it's all right. I said, tell me where Jesus is. He said, he's down in my heart. Down in my life, that's where he's at. He knew. I tell you what, it was so different. He looked over at his wife. And I'm going to tell you something. They had fought like cats and dogs all their life. They had fought like cats and dogs. I, I don't know anything about it, but they are the ones that told me that. Both of them told me that. Said, we've been so mean to each other. Said, it's pitiful. It really is pitiful. Don't lie in the world. We stayed together. They said, we've been so mean to each other. He looked over at her and he said, hey, he said, will you forgive me? He said, I'm so sorry for the way that I treat him. Take some. Jesus Christ changes your heart. You want to ask people to forgive you. Right. You do. You want to get rid of all that. You want to get things fixed up between other people as well. And he said, Kay, I'm so sorry. He said, will you forgive me? And he said, Kay, he said, I want you to get saved too. He said, will you give your heart to God and, and, and meet me in heaven after I'm gone? She looked over at, at me and she said, Richard said, we've been so bad, God couldn't forgive both of us in the same day. I said, okay, God's big enough to forgive both of you in the same day. She said, no, no, not now. He looked at her again and he said, okay. He said, will you promise me that you'll meet me in heaven? Here's the atheist lady, agnostic man. He's a believer now. Here's the atheist lady. And she looked at him. He said, Keith, I'll meet you in heaven. I'll meet you in heaven. Just a few days, and he was gone. I had his funeral. Kate started coming to the church. I don't know just exactly what time of year it was. It wasn't too awful long a month, maybe or two. And, and uh, Kate would come and she'd sit down here just to take the seat of where my wife's sitting right now. And she'd sit right there. And I remember on this Sunday morning, it was just a Sunday before Christmas. And I preached a Christmas message. A little salvation message, really. Tears began to run down the cheeks. Eight gets late. She got a number seat. She had a walker. She had to have a walker. She had legs were bad. She had to have a walker. She got out of there and got that walker. She started down towards the altar. And I tell you what, the whole church, this company, just all of a sudden, boy, the Holy Spirit just settled down over the whole place. It just everybody was touched and moved. Atheist lady coming down, down the aisle to the altar. She come down there. I told one of the ladies, I said, would you, would you get a chair? Because she, she can't kneel down. She said, no. She said, no. She said, I'm going to kneel. I may not be able to kneel, but she says, I'm going to kneel. She got down here at the altar. She knelt down. I tell you what, we began to pray for what we long in our pray. The old tears running down, messing up all of her masked hair and everything. Just a little bit. She got clear through. I can tell you that today she's still serving God. She comes down every now and then to visit with my son. She's taken such a, a interest in them and a liking to them. She comes down and visits with them and tries to help them out. And so on. What did I tell you that for? I tell you that because, friends, he had an experience of what it was like to go to hell. God was merciful and let him come back. But friends, it's a real place. 
and people are going to go there and they're going there by the hour and by the minute people are leaving this little world and we want to do what we can. Are you listening to me? Do you have any burden whatsoever in your heart? Does it trouble you? Are you concerned about yourself and about those that are around you? That's the trouble. That's what bothers me the most is in our day and time we don't seem to be too concerned about people that are dying going to hell and for all eternity. And Jesus said that one man's soul was worth more than the whole world. If you could gain the whole world, He said, and lose your soul. He said, what have you gained? There's nothing, nothing more valuable than a person's soul and to think that they're lost and going to hell. I want to close with this last illustration. And this is true, friends. I didn't know this until just a little while ago, a few months ago, really. National Geographic has done a documentary. There are six places in this earth that they call them the gates of hell. That's what they call them, the gates of hell. You can look it up on the on the internet if you want to. PBS did a documentary on it and so on. National Geographic. And they say that you can go. They say you can go to one of those places. And they say that actually you can stand there and you can hear. And it sounds like those cries, eerie screams of people down in that bottomless pit scream crying out in a place called hell. Friends, you and I need to take seriously this matter. And we need to think of our own souls. Where am I in my relationship with God? Am I playing with my soul? Am I playing church? Am I really serious about this matter? Am I selfish? Do I really want to humble myself before God and say, God in heaven, save me, clean me up, make me everything I ought to be, make me fit for heaven, take my life, God, let me live for You, let me be a witness out here in our world and where I live, help me to get my family in, I don't want to see anybody lost. I don't want to see any of my family lost. How about it, friends? How is it with your soul? How concerned are you for the loss that is all around you? There's a place called hell. You don't believe it. One second after you take that last breath, you will believe it, friends. But it's too late. And for all, eternity. Will you stand with me while I come to lead us in a song tonight? Father, I appreciate your presence here in this place. You have helped us, God, as we try to share out of our hearts. <clears throat> Lord, I don't want anybody lost. Oh, God. Lord, I think of all, and I, I just cry out, and I pray, God, that you'll still help, help us, Lord, somehow. Help us to be that witness yes. to get them in. But Lord, anybody, anybody that's lost, God, we want to try to get them in. I don't want to see anybody lost. And I pray for the ones of us that are here, the children, the young people, Lord, the older ones, every one of us. I pray that God in our hearts will write. If we're not, Lord, help us to make that move to an altar of prayer and say, God, help me. And if we really know that we're right in our hearts, then I pray that God, you'll put a burden on us. We'll pray to that end and say, God, here, burden my heart for my family, for those neighbors around me, those people that I care about. And let me, Lord, witness and get them to you before it's too late. Help us, God. We can if we'll just do our part. We ask it in Christ's name. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in the rest of this service, we pray. Proverbs 3, verse 7, it says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from me. Fear the Lord and depart from me. The Bible also says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, my dad passed away last year. 
things and you know, similar stories like Bob has. You know, it's a hard thing to lose a family member. It's a harder thing to not know where they end up. It really is. I'm just being honest with you, sharing my heart with you. And uh, as my dad picked me up from jail one time, he was driving me home. I shared this with the kids on the altar last night. He said, you know, he said, Bill, what was one thing that we could have done to keep you from getting into a life of drugs and crime and all this? And I said, Dad, if I'd have been raised in church, my family would have been Christians. I don't think that if I knew now, if I knew now what I know, I've got saved and I'm for you. Oh, yeah. I said, you know, if oh, I knew yes. now yes. what I know, I would have never done this. Stuff. Get this right now. Don't go through a life of torment. Don't go through a life of the faithlessness and the botch around the heart of the hard way. Um, um, Come and get it settled. You know, the Bible says in Romans, chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. When you come and put your faith in Jesus, what, what real faith in Jesus says, I fear you, Lord. I'm departing from iniquity tonight. I am, I'm leaving the sin life. I'm going to live the rest of my days to serve you from faith to faith and from glory to glory. So these altars are open. We've got a heavy heart. Let us sing this song in me in 327. Let's get our eyes upon Jesus. If your eyes aren't on Jesus, get them on there tonight. Listen, don't try to clean yourself up before you, before you get saved. Let Jesus do the cleaning. You come up here just as you are and let Jesus just cleanse you. Verse 1. Oh, soul, are you weary and tried? It's not going to. 
And I'm saying this with love and with urgency in my heart. That if you're living in sin right now, I don't care if you've made a profession of faith. I don't care if you say that you got saved. You went through a prayer. Christians do not live a life of sin. And it's Christians who go to heaven. And it's sinners who go to heaven. And we've came in touch with eternity tonight. And I want you to know this. God loves you more than you could ever love any of your family members. More than you could ever love anything on this earth. You don't know that kind of love. You really don't know that kind of love until you've experienced it yourself. Don't let the devil elevate these sins above the love of God. Because that's what keeps us from harm. See it for what it is tonight. And say, listen, I choose Jesus. I'm turning my eyes on Jesus tonight. It's time for Him to put my life together. It's miserable to live without. We're going to sing this last verse. You don't know. We've lost four or five people out of this church just in two years. You really don't know the last time you walked out of that door. You really don't. It's one thing to come to church. It's another thing to be able to unashamedly come to Jesus Christ. All together. All together. Come and meet with Him tonight. It will change your life forever. Verse 3. His word shall not fail you. He
me do this one more time if I could. The, the don't let me just kind of come and get around here at the front. This is my last service here tonight in the latest week. And if you would, I, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. You just come. Come and stand here just right in the front of us, please. 